All right, welcome everybody to yet another episode of Voices of Influence. Here we are talking to Troy Helming about getting zero to one. And Troy is like in the world of energy tech and he's a serial entrepreneur in the space. I'm very, very excited to welcome Troy to our show. Troy, welcome. Thank you, Arjun. Happy to be here. Awesome, Troy. I'm going to say that I looked at your LinkedIn and like the entrepreneurial journey that you have, and it was just a little a lot of overwhelming. You've done like multiple startups and many of them at the same time as well. And so just walk us through what has this been your entrepreneurial journey like between multiple startups and different companies that you worked at? <clears throat> yeah, I, I yeah, feel like it's definitely in my blood. I grew up in a home with uh, my dad was an entrepreneur. Most of my aunts and uncles were. So I kind of knew that was for me, but I wanted to go to uh, to college, get a business degree, and then uh, go to work for somebody else. So I did that at AT and T for a few years. Figured out what I'm good at, but more importantly, what I'm not good at, uh, and okay. where I needed help. <clears throat> but yeah, I've been mostly in infrastructure and clean energy. Um, so I'm the CEO and founder of EarthGrid. For me, that's company number eight, and I've had one failure and six exits. And of the exits. Four were meaningful and uh, two were like basically, you know, barely made any money, like barely six figures. But four of them were meaningful. Two of them were, you know, uh, became unicorns. That is incredible. It's eight companies. I think we're all losing hair over here running one company. So I think this is just incredible to know. And the latest being EarthGrid. Um, so just tell me, like, you know, in the world of like energy tech, like, you know, each company I would imagine takes like a long time to build and they like, get it to, it's not like a, a, a social media startup that you like build and like build a software and they like, go on with that, right? Like, so these things right. take some time. So what does it mean to actually like be part of like eight different startups? Like, uh, tell us how, how that happens. <laughs> Sure. Well, the time period we're talking about here is 32 years. So I left AT&T in 1992. I'm 56 years old and uh, uh, have still have a lot of a lot of energy. Um, I'm an athlete and uh, take care of my health. Hardly ever drank. I've never smoked, you know, organic food, massage, yoga for 30 years, rock climbing, ninja warrior competitions, all of that keeps keeps the energy going. But uh, yeah, I mean, it does. So my first company was telecommunications, did that for a few years uh, and built it up to be the largest distributor of Lucent Technologies and Nextel wireless equipment in um, that part of the Midwest. And uh, margins were getting squeezed. And I read an article that said Kansas, Texas and North Dakota had enough wind energy potential to power the whole country. So I was like, wow, I grew up in a, palace, uh, in a house that was solar powered or solar heated, I should say. Uh, in 1980. And so I got my exposure to clean energy as a kid. It was one of my chores maintaining solar. So I've been around solar since 1980, 44 years, if you can wow. believe that. Anyway, um, <clears throat> yeah, but uh, actually 45. So it was done in 79. Technically, we moved in in 1980. Uh, but wow. uh, yeah, so uh, it took uh, probably five years to get the wind company really off the ground and going. Ultimately, I sold most of my shares in 2004, but that company, Trade Wind Energy, uh, became the largest wind developer in the United States in 2017 mm -hmm. and we're number two in 2018. But you're right, it does take time. And then um, I switched to solar and that took about a decade to really uh, grow quickly. But we did have, let's see, it was about five years in that we had $100 million of assets on the balance sheet at that company. But mm -hmm. it, it takes time to care. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a, a, a big effort every time you have to like start something like this. But while we're talking about energy tech, I think I wanted to get like your thoughts on like what is going on in the world of energy tech and like now with AI coming in over here, just tell us how the world of energy, like the world of energy is always hot, uh, but like how is AI changing it or is it even? Yeah, it'll help. AI will help a bit, but I'm going to say something that may not be super popular. People don't want to hear it, but there's no way that software or AI can solve the climate crisis or the energy transition. Uh, can it help? Sure. But we have to build real world infrastructure, you know, steel in the ground and, and physical infrastructure. And, and that starts really with the grid. 
uh, our our grid in, in the US and the grid in Europe, the grid pretty much all over the world was not designed for huge quantities of intermittent renewable resources. And so it needs to be enhanced, upgraded, not rebuilt, but significant upgrades. Uh, software will help make it more efficient um, and minor things like, uh, you know, and AI will as well, of course, and minor things uh, like reconducting lines can help maybe another 5%. Software and AI could probably improve our grid and improve the power flow by 5 to 10%, maybe 15% based okay. on our current energy needs. But as we are electrifying everything, you know, vehicles mm. and heating and industrial processes are all switching to electricity because electricity is now cheap, right? Thanks to the proliferation right. of wind and solar. So that'll double the need for our grid. And then AI, the and this this is where you know I think you might be headed, but AI and and data centers are going to double again the need for power, mm. and and right. so no way to meet that need. And I'll give you a, a quick example, and then I'll shut up. Um, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> we've talked to a lot of data center companies at EarthGrid, and, and EarthGrid has uh, you know plasma tunnel boring tech to build tunnels to put power lines and fiber underground and do it in one to two years mm -hmm. rather than 10 to 20 years that it takes to get new overhead transmission lines approved because nobody wants them. NIMBYs and bananas mm -hmm. will fight to slow or stop the project. Anyway, mm -hmm. the data center companies have, I've been watching this for years, right? And it used to be, okay, yeah, they'll move in and they'll ask the utility for power. The utility would say, sure, 18 months, two years, we'll get you the power you need. Then that moved to three or four years. Then it was five years. And now it's just, no, utilities mm -hmm. have no solution uh, because the demand for power is vastly exceeding the grid's ability for that utility to handle it. And this is happening all over the United States, all over Europe. So, yeah, um, AI is going to cause a huge increase in the need for infrastructure. Um, and we got to put, you know, steel, steel in the ground or steel in the air. I think it should be underground for the for the power lines uh, and, right. and build more wind and solar. That is interesting. I actually was thinking more from the lines of how AI can like make world better. It almost seems like the power consumption of AI is making this world a little worse in some ways. I'm guessing that the same should be true for like the world of uh, cryptocurrency as well. Like I would say that the power consumption of that is probably a little bit even more higher in some ways. Uh, what have you, what have you noticed along those lines? Well, I'm not an expert in that area. I would be probably considered an expert in in the energy business, but not in in data centers or certainly AI. But yeah, we well, yes and no. We we're, we're hearing that yeah, crypto and and just blockchain overall, because it's not just cryptocurrency, but blockchain transactions for contracts. Yeah, yeah, that is is increasing almost at a at an exponential, well, not exponential, but a very rapid rate. Um, however, some of the new chips from Nvidia for AI are going to put a big energy demand on on the grid as well mm -hmm. and some of the estimates um, just from the nvidia rollout and their their business model and their business plan rather and, and forecast shows uh energy consumption needs going up 2x to 3x over where they are now this is interesting yeah um yeah it, it's with everybody like thinking about like all these advances and like feeling very excited about this we just don't realize like the uh core energy consumption we just take those for granted for sure right uh so switching back to like the world of like starting companies especially like let's take the latest earth credit for instance tell us about like what did what does it mean to go from zero to one in this world of energy tech as you said like you know everything takes like what was five to 10 years, you're bringing it to one to two years, but it still seems like a couple of years before you can actually like validate, uh, get to some sense that like, okay, there is product market fit over here. Walk us through like, what are some of the unique challenges in going from zero to one in this, uh, in the startup? Yeah, so I formed EarthGrid in 2016. So we've been at it for a while <clears throat> and it has not been easy. Uh, and I'll right. give you a few of the challenges here in a moment, but um, we, uh, yeah, we uh, basically started it or I started it uh, because I was inspired by a Navy SEAL who was at, at my solar company at the time bragging to his girlfriend about how his SEAL team used to uh, practice entering enemy ships by going underwater and cutting through the side of the ship with a plasma cutting torch. 
and he's bragging to his mm. girlfriend at a bar. We're like, wow, dude, you're amazing. And, and so he's like, yeah, that thing's 20,000 degrees. It'd take your arm off. Anyway, I pop up in the middle of the night thinking, wow, 20,000 degrees. Is that hot enough to go through rock? Yeah, researching, yeah, it is hot enough to vaporize it. Well, surely somebody's doing this researching. No, no one's doing it. I couldn't stop thinking about it. Anyway, built the first prototype in late 2017 after you know hiring an engineering firm to do some feasibility work for me. And it was a little side project. Didn't even tell my wife about it. Just took a little money wow. and set aside. Yeah, and um, tinkered in a in an industrial an industrial warehouse in Oakland, California. Built the first prototype and punched a hole through a car sized boulder of granite. And I was like, yeah, it works. Um, and at the time, I was like, this is either going to be a nothing company or a billion dollar company. Um, so <laughs> anyway, fast forward to today, um, you know, we have a prototype out in the field. We made money with it last year. We're building a two torch system and a six torch system that will build, you know, bore tunnels of one to two and a half meters in diameter. Uh, three to eight feet for those people uh, still in the dark ages using <laughs> inches. Um, but uh, anyway, um, some of the challenges. The company was attacked along the way. People tried to steal the tech. So I had to deal with litigation. I had to deal with personnel issues, um, you know, and, and um, you know, a variety of things. But uh, and, and raising capital, I was, you know, unusual as a founder in that I've had a track record and I've had exits. So I was able to bootstrap the company for the first few years. Mm. Um, but then going out and raising capital, here I am a serial entrepreneur with multiple exits, including two unicorns, exciting world changing tech. And yet uh, to raise my pre-seed round and my seed round, which we oversubscribed to both of them, you know, thankfully I'm so grateful to our investors, but I had to give 2000 pitches to raise the money for my what 2000 2000 2, yeah over the course Whoa. of years not a whole lot of people have the stomach or the tenacity for that and so for those founders listening to this it's not easy just because you have an amazing idea money's not going to start rolling in it takes a lot of work and so raising money is like having two full-time jobs plus you have to run the company and do all the other things so it's like you have three jobs <laughs> I, I'm just like, my, I, I think we're all like kind of spoiled, even though we are in the startup world, I think we we do like a fraction of what you do in terms of effort and like 2000 pitches, yeah, and over three years, having bootstrapped and having gone through multiple exits in the past, that sounds like incredible, yeah. Uh, so t t tell me more, and like, and of course, fundraising is just one part of it, right? Like, so there's also like getting the customers and like going there from zero to one as well. Yeah, customer acquisition, it's going well now, but for the longest time, nobody believed that it was even possible, right? And no one wants to mm -hmm. be first. So we had to move out of the lab and then do testing in an industrial facility. And then we had to go out into the field and do testing. And we bring people out and then they bring their engineers out and then they bring, you know, it's, it's just, it's a process. But uh, finally, we found some friendly customers that were like, all right, dig us a trench with your plasma machine in this hard rock where, you know, we can't we can't use conventional trenching equipment. We have to use dynamite or or jackhammers. <clears throat> so we did that and, and made some money and took some great videos. We spent, I think, eight thousand dollars to bring in a, a really good videographer, took great videos and pictures. And and that really helped a lot. Um, and then we did a test tunnel of 2.5 meters in diameter uh, and lined it with concrete and shotcrete. And that has gone so far in helping get customers comfortable. So, yes, we do have some contracts signed now and about 32 signed LOIs and MOUs, which are kind of worthless. But, you know, it's at least an indication that the marketplace is interested. And um, but now the real contracts are finally starting to come in. Wow. And this is like eight years since then. Like, I mean, I think like the scale of what energy and like what you have to do and also like you're having to like build this. This is not like, you know, a concept or like just a, a, a model that you built. You you have to like build a real tech to like even yeah. validate whether this is viable or not. Um, incredible. And so I think like this, this, these contracts is MOU and these LOIs that you're signing over here. And I, and I almost think that like in this energy tech world, like it's not like 
oh, you bring a marketing channel and you just like do something and you're doing this. It's a lot about relationship and everything, right? Like, so walk me through like what it means to acquire customers over here. Like how long do these sales cycle takes and like what, what kind of challenges are you going through when you have to, um, from, you know, finding somebody all the way to closing the sale? Yeah, great question. And it really depends on the vertical that we're in, whether it's, you know, private companies that are small to midsize versus private that are low. And, and I'm saying these in order of, of easiness. So I'm starting with the easiest first and then progressively more difficult with a longer sales cycle. So small companies, large companies, utilities and government. And so we're staying away mm -hmm. from government and we're not staying away from utilities. Well, I say staying away from government. We did apply for some grants and so forth, and we were awarded a, an SBIR grant with the U.S. Air Force. Did some initial work on a project there, but other than you know grant-related you know customer work, uh, we are staying away from government. Uh, utilities yeah. we're talking to, but yeah, we're finding that the um, the best thing to do, particularly in energy tech, climate tech, green tech, is to find the low-hanging fruit. And for us, that has been. Mm -hmm solar wind and battery developers who are mm -hmm. waiting three to seven years to get their projects through the interconnection queue and connected to the grid used to be one year year and a half and now it's three to seven years so to speed up that their ability to you know we're going to them and we're saying hey how about we bore a tunnel from your project site to a, a better substation that has you know nobody else trying to connect to that place or mm -hmm. better yet directly to a data center or a factory or a corporate campus or whatever and and so those are kind of the low-hanging fruit and, and to answer your question on sales cycle it's typically now that we have test projects and customer projects that we can show people uh that sales cycle is probably about three to four months for mm -hmm. the smaller companies and then the larger companies, it's probably more like six to nine months. Got it. Okay. Wow. So this is a, a full blown, like uh, a team that's like working on this, a sales team that's working on this. And I'm guessing like you're building relationship with these people. Like what is like, you were attending a conference right now in New York and like, you know, tell me more about like, what are your top of the funnel activities that like get you to in front of the customers and like how much of marketing is involved and how much is like sort of direct sales outreach and then like reaching out to these people yeah well we built a, a team of over 40 commission only outside salespeople. so there's no monthly okay. burn or overhead related to that but we're very generous on the back end with really rich mm -hmm. commissions 20 percent of gross profit not of gross revenue but gross profit um, and, and that's because gross profit on a project varies widely uh, depending on, on, right. the pro on the project. But uh, so we do that. We do some marketing. We have um, a cool company that does use AI to help with uh, marketing and lead generation. And that's generated some solid leads, although not as not as exciting as we were hoping. But, you know, some solid leads. But the bulk of our sales funnel is coming from attending conferences like, like we go to data center conferences mm -hmm. and uh, clean energy conferences like Distributech and others that uh, have people that are struggling with the problem that I mentioned earlier, you know, that, that four mm -hmm. out of five solar and wind projects die. They get abandoned or canceled right. before they ever get built because of the problem of lack of, of sufficient transmission capacity or high interconnection costs. So that's a an acute problem that we're trying to solve. So we're talking to those people. And then, as I mentioned earlier, data center folks trying to get power faster. I like it. Yeah, this definitely seems like uh, um, some of the more standard channels that like uh, most people are like thinking about and sort of uh, shifting gears to like talk about like you have um, a brand personal brand around yourself, like you've been through energy tech a while and you have also done this, how much of this personal brand is actually like helping you, um, you know, both with investors as well as with uh, getting new deals? Is that actually like a part of your go to market strategy at all? You are using your personal brand? It is. Uh, and there's a, a few things right off the bat. I mentioned already that I've been an athlete, you know, so uh, having having that energy level as an athlete you know I, I sleep really well at night i get up early in the morning work out i have the energy to to do this and do the wear the multiple hats you have to have to wear as a as a startup founder 
Um, so that's one. Number two would be my my brand related to having a long history in clean energy, right? And mm. uh, and that helps when I'm talking to clean energy investors or um, you know or customers, either one that have experience there. Uh, third would be that same uh, history of being in clean energy uh, allows me to uh, be taken seriously when I talk about helping you know those those types of uh, of customers understand that there are obstacles on project development. Developing a tunnel is similar to developing a solar farm or a wind farm. It can take mm. a couple of years and there are permitting and regulatory and rights of way issues and all kinds of issues. It's hard. You have to have the right kind of stomach for it. And and so because I've built big companies in the past, I can say, hey, I've, I'm you know, going to do it again. That's unusual. Again, most founders can't say that. But having that experience, even if I had been an employee at a company doing that kind of work, I could say, hey, I know what it takes to go through the difficult process of of encountering a challenge and getting through it. And then the last part of my personal brand is I have been invited to compete on American Ninja Warrior, the NBC hit show four times. Right. And so my my favorite sport is Ninja Warrior obstacle course racing. And so uh, my sport of choice being learning how to overcome obstacles, failing over and over and over again nice. and finding a way to figure a way through it translates very well to developing difficult infrastructure projects as well as building a company. Yeah, I, I, I was going to ask you about that part of it. I think like the last part, I think I, I like everything about like a personal brand you have a, established as an entrepreneur and an expert in the clean energy, I mean, energy field. And then the idea that like you have experiences um, that are done this and then also like the brand around like the, the one who can actually like work around obstacles. That's actually like a great personal brand. How much does that help? Like, you know, I'm just kind of curious about like the whole ninja warrior uh, aspect of it. I know that this has been obviously given you the physical energy it takes to like do so many startups over like all these years, but also like the, the mindset shift, is that actually like helping you from all these different uh, hats that you're wearing and like in terms of grit or perseverance, is that actually like helpful? Oh, hundred percent. And I would say that before I got into Ninja Warrior, like five years ago, I was a rock climber off and on mm. since the early nineties. So, um, you know, also 30, 30 years or so. And, and so similarly, you fail all the time when you're bouldering or rock climbing until you figure out the path and the route and they change the routes all the time. So it's a very mental, you know, uh, you know, process to, to try to figure out the rock climbing route or a ninja warrior route. And I'm sure there's other sports with similar types of, of, of mental cerebral uh, challenges, but that has helped me so much because it's helped me learn that failure is okay. And a lot of people don't have thick skin and, and when they get turned down by an investor, it deflates them, right? 2000 pitches, 97% no's, only 3% yeses, right? I Every time I got a no, I celebrated because I was like, okay, I need 33 no's before I get a yes. And so I would mm. check it out, right? And it, each no, or ghosting, a lot of investors would just ghost me. And so after a period of time, you know, follow up three or four times and I don't want to be a pest and, and you got to move on. So then, you know, that's a default no or a de facto no. Uh, but yes, um, rock climbing and Ninja Warrior, you build up that grit, as you said, uh, great word, build up the resilience um, and and that you, you know that if you keep, if you get back up off the mat and keep trying, eventually you're going to figure it out. And and I'd love to like say like I am obviously in uh, a founder and like not everybody is like build ninja warrior material for sure not me but what do you suggest are like some of the things that uh, especially from this uh, tenacity and like grit perspective what are some things that like founders can take away from this in terms of like what can they do to um, you know have this in like you know go away from this fear of failure and everything else as well. Yeah, well, <clears throat> and this applies to both raising money with investors as well as talking to customers. So I was fortunate that my first job out of college at at and I got great sales training and I learned objection handling, rapport build, building, relationship, you know, building all mm -hmm. of the things that are that are important. And that translates to, to raising capital as well. So I would say if if you uh, don't feel like you have 
the athletic body to do Ninja Warrior or rock climbing, find a sport and rock climbing and Ninja Warrior. There's gyms all over the world, right? So anybody can take right. that up as a sport. And and I should I should point out, I I didn't start out great. In fact, when I started Ninja Warrior, my son is the one who who he found the show on TV. We got into it, and I was like, oh. Ninja Warrior gyms. That's a thing. I'm going to go to one and try it out. I've been a rock climber for 30 years. I was a gymnast in college. Oh, I got this. It's easy. And I threw out my back and injured my shoulder the first time I went to a ninja Ouch. gym. <laughs> Ouch. Okay. It made me mad. I'm competitive. And so I went back after I recovered a couple of weeks later and tried it again, got a little bit better and just kept going back. Anyway, so pick a sport, pick something that's new that you can do in your free time that is outside of your comfort zone. That's the most important thing. Doesn't really matter what it is, but pick something that's outside your comfort zone where you know you're going to fail. Learn to fail and overcome that failure over and over and over again. And then it just becomes second nature and it won't bother you. Mm. you and you say free time. I mean, I know that like, you know, for someone who actually wears as many hats as you do, like, you know, that's hard to come by itself and make. So, what is your style? And typically, like, you know, having done this for so many years and having done so many of these startups, are you still in like full time hustle mode, spending that like 70, 80 hours a week uh, hustling on this? Or have you like figured out like a way to do this with balance and still be able to juggle all these different hats that you have to wear? I love that question. No, uh, balance is so important. I almost never set an alarm. Getting a good night's sleep is so, so, so important. I cannot overemphasize that enough. So um, a lot of people brag about, yeah, I can get, do just fine on six hours of sleep or less. Forget about it. No, 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 no. Get enough sleep. That's mm -hmm. number one for me. Uh, I uh, just celebrated my 20-year wedding anniversary with my wife. I strive to be a good husband and a good father. Uh, my dad was a workaholic. I didn't see him much growing up, so I made a promise to never be like that. So I never I, I pick one day each weekend where I don't work at all. It's usually Sunday, sometimes Saturday. And then the other day I will do my like my special projects, you know, some emails or special projects at home, quiet time where, you know, where I need a bunch of uninterrupted time. And then during the week, I do put in, you know, I start early, I get up really early and I and I work out I, and I go to bed early enough and I just naturally wake up usually around 6, 630. I work out, uh, at least do 20, 30 minutes of weights. I don't do a whole lot of cardio other than jogging with the dog at night. Um, but some HIIT training, um, by cardio, I mean traditional cardio, like or biting or whatever. I do some of that, but mostly I do HIIT, high, in high, interval, high intensity interval training. Uh, as well as uh, uh, weightlifting and then ninja and rock climbing once or twice a week. Um, but uh, yeah, I put in a really solid, uh, you know, 10 hours or so during the week. So it's like 55 to maybe 60 hours a week of work time. Um, mm. And I take time to meditate twice a day. I decompress at night. I visualize, I tell my subconscious at night before I go to bed, let go of everything you don't need, all the clutter that you accumulated today. Let go of all of that and hold on to what you do need. I call it my purging moment. And, <laughs> I, and I have a few mantras I say to myself. And I also meditate in the morning after I work out, do this, the infrared sauna and, and meditate. So anyway, that's my, um, you know, my form of balance. Pick what works for you. Um, but physical, spiritual, mental, family, financial, try to keep all of it in balance. I love it. I mean, I think yeah, I, I'm I'm amazed at like how you've kept all of these in balance. I feel like it's uh, easier said than done. And like I've seen so many people like sort of uh, burn out very quickly after one startup or even like halfway through a startup, they like, just like easily burn out. And like the kind of physical conditioning and mental conditioning that you're going through seems like it's uh, it's almost like an essential, especially if you're on a startup journey. But for, for the most part, everybody as well um, as well. Uh, but always people give the excuse, including myself about like, you know, it's like, hey, how hard it is and how much time it takes. And like, it's so hard to like do all of these things. But I'm amazed that like you're able to still do this part of it. Um, well, try this it was, hasn't been easy. Yeah. And I will. Yeah. I'm sorry. Just one last thing. I will yeah, say that please. I am super aggressive about being efficient. Like I aggressively mm -hmm. archive emails. I aggressively spend time unsubscribing. Um, you know, to, to emails and um, my meetings. I try to keep all of my meetings that I do with my team to 15 minutes, sometimes 30 if it's a larger group. 
and whoever organizes the meeting, if you don't have an agenda and you don't go really, really fast and you're not giving updates, never updates. Updates are, they go in re weekly reports that people can read. So don't give updates, but anyway, so um, super, super efficient with, with how I operate. And so I feel like I get, you know, more work done during the, the 10 hours or so that I work during the week. Uh, I'm probably like a 2X to 3X a normal person because of the efficiency tips that mm -hmm. I have integrated into into my work life. I love it. I think I probably should do like a behavioral ep science episode on like just this part of it in itself because I'm I'm very excited about that aspect of it and like we're like going more into that and it's sort of piquing my interest a lot. But uh, I think for this has been a pleasure talking to you, especially like, you know, your journey from like, uh, you know, all the way from telecommunication to wind energy to like solar to like and now Earth Grid, like I feel like I learned a lot and like more than just learning, it's almost like I feel like very inspired, like talking to you about like your uh, journey over here. So thanks again, Troy, for being on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you, Arjun. My pleasure.